Jay here, and today I'm doing another gang profile video. The goal of the gang profile series is to give examples of how to create Necromunda gangs by pulling inspiration from different sources. The gang in this video uses an historical source. The Sump Pirates are the gang that I am covering today, from inspiration to the rules and the minis, this time on JD in the Sump Sea. So I first got inspiration for making pirates from the TV show Our Flag Means Death. This is a comedy show about the historical pirate figure Steed Bonnet. The story goes that Steed, who was the son of a wealthy landowner in Barbados, left his wife and kids in 1717 and bought a ship and decided to become a pirate. He was a successful pirate for about a year or so, and he even met Blackbeard, whom he became fast friends with and it's this relationship that the TV show leans on. Now I decided that this was a great basis for a sump pirate gang for Necromunda. The sump boards that Dee created are perfect for a sump pirate campaign. Now that I have the idea for a gang, I have to execute that idea. So what rules and what models will I use? Since the leader of this new gang has run away from his family and friends and money, it would make sense that this gang would be an outcast gang built around an outcast noble. What noble house would my leader be an outcast from is the next question. Well, the original Steed Bonnet was portrayed on the TV show is kind of an uptight fancy dresser who is clearly a fish out of water, so I'm going to go with the noble house Ulanti. House Ulanti are consummate hedonists, the ultra-wealthy elite of Necromunda, whose thirst for luxury is matched only by their fickle loyalties. So, knowing that I am going with House Ulanti, I need a suitably flamboyant or opulent model to portray him on the battlefield. I found the model bared from Arturos III from Forge World, and decided that was the perfect model to use as a base. So I have my affiliation set for my leader, and I have a base model. Now I need to know what rules I will use for him. I could pick one of the standard outcast leader profiles, but why do that when I have the outstanding fan supplement by Casper Cook and Alexander Lund titled Book of the Sump. In the Book of the Sump there is lore, a map, special campaign rules for battles in the sump, new weapons and war gear for the trading post, rules for watercraft and new monsters, characters, and a new hanger-on. As an outcast leader, I can pick a profile from anywhere in Necromunda and use that profile along with the weapons, or your special rules and skills it comes with, and use that as my leader. This is what I did for the new hanger-on from Book of the Sump, called the Sump Captain. I named him Steve Bennett, and I converted up the mini. Steve Bennett, the Gentleman Pirate. He is a sump captain hanger-on turned outcast leader. The weapons he comes with are a shotgun with both solid and scatter shot, in addition to an underslung auxiliary harpoon launcher. The other weapon he has is a pincer pattern servo claw. The auxiliary harpoon launcher and the pincer pattern servo claw are new weapons introduced in the Book of the Sump. The pincer pattern servo claw is especially nice since it has sever. There are very few weapons in this game that have Sever. Basically, Sever says that when you get to the stage when you have to roll an injury die to see what happens to the opposing ganger you're fighting, instead of rolling that die, they're simply taken out of action. It's quite powerful. The Auxiliary Harpoon Launcher is thematic, since some spiders are defined and given stats, and the arbitrator is encouraged to use them in missions in the Book of the Sump. If the Harpoon Launcher is used in a mission and it kills a sump spider, then the player who killed the sump spider gains extra cash after the battle. He also has mesh armor and the skill Unstoppable, which is nice in that it can remove flesh wounds in the recovery phase, or allow two dice to be rolled in the recovery phase instead of one. I used an Escher shotgun for his gun, and since the gun was too small to mount harpoons on it, I gave him a backpack filled with two harpoons. That bit was from the old Necromunda Scaly model and his pincer pattern servo claw is a modified orc power claw. He is the archetype mastermind. He also has two special rules that come along with being a sump captain. 
He has a Cyber Crow, which gives him 360 degree vision arc and 12 on sentry spotting. He's also a Captain, which gives him a reroll of a handling check or missed shooting attack per round on any vehicle that he is in. Fiery Jack is Steve's first mate. He's an outcast champion, and he has a power sword, a hand flamer, and the skill Nerves of Steel. Outcast champions are pretty inexpensive usually, and while 185 isn't really cheap for an outcast champion, he does have some nice weapons. I usually start gangs with less warrior at creation, and then after a game or two begin upgrading them with things like armor and grenades. Having Nerves of Steel and a power sword will hopefully get him into combat, and it's also nice to have a weapon that causes blaze in an outcast gang, because it can really help that gang make up for deficiencies that it may have in other areas. The hand flamer fills that hole in the gang in this circumstance quite nicely. Bartholomew Roberts is the second outcast champion in this gang, and he's carrying a grenade launcher with both frag and crack grenades. He, like Fiery Jack, has no armor. I think the model justifies no armor as much as my philosophy on gangs at gang creation justifies no armor. He has the gunslinger archetype and I gave him the fast shot rule. Fast shot is a very nasty skill allowing the model to fire twice in the same turn. Shooting two crack grenades in the same activation is just brutal. Bartholomew allows me to have a second weapon like the hand flamer that can deal with bigger threats. Jolly Roger is my brute. We usually allow gangs to begin with a hanger on or brute so I made this guy with the body of an old Mordheim ogre the head of an old metal Imperial Guard Ogrin, and the power claw of an orc knob. He has an augmentic fist and a spud jacker. The spud jacker actually is a weapon that costs negative 20 credits on an Ogrin. I partly chose it so I could save some credits, but also I thought his two hands looked so different that they should be different weapons. He comes with the headbutt skill. He also has two special rules. He is loyal, so assists from him are plus two instead of plus one, and he's also slow-witted, meaning he can't be part of a group activation. And now we get into the regular gangers. I tried to keep them pretty cheap and pretty basic. With outcast gangs, I feel like you need to play them with the mentality that they really aren't worth much. Each model, besides the leader, are expendable, and so don't spend many credits on them, and if one dies, just recruit another one. The tactics cards really go into this more, but we'll talk about those later. This is Emmanuel Wynn. He has an auto gun and a fighting knife. Bosch Braziliano is the next ganger. He has an auto gun and no armor. You'll notice I actually have a lot of 24 inch range weaponry in this gang, and that's on purpose. Keeping the enemy away from you is a good idea when playing outcasts who are easily killed. Jean Ducasse has a las gun and also a chainsword for some hand to hand punch. Las guns are great because if you aim and then fire at a model 18 inches away, you're hitting on a 2 plus with an outcast hive scum ganger. It's a great, cheap, and easy way to pin opposing gangers. Vincenzo Alessandri also has a las gun and no armor, again, keeping with the ranged and cheap theme. Francois de Leonese has a las gun and a fighting knife. Most of my gang are named after real pirates. This is another way to lean into the theme. If possible, look up names that go with the idea that you have. Rene Rochefort has a halberd, but in game terms it counts as a two-handed axe. He also has a stub gun. I just like the way he looks, and that was the whole reason for this guy. He doesn't really factor into my plans with how the gang works, and that's okay. When designing new gangs, you don't have to make them the toughest, meanest thing out there. I think sometimes people need to hear that it's okay to not be a power gamer, and to just make models that are fun. And rounding out the last of the gangers is Red Legs Greaves. He has a stub gun and a fighting knife. And this is a real pirate's name. When I saw it, I knew that I needed to have a ganger named Red Legs Greaves. So I found this model and I painted his tall boots red. And there we go. In our campaigns, we choose 12 tactics cards and we're allowed to pick two of them for each game. 
If they're unused, they go back in the deck. If they're used, they can't be used again in the campaign unless you run out of cards. Then the whole deck is refreshed. Regardless of how my group plays with tactics cards, the Outcast tactics cards are worth looking at because they can really shape how you play with the gang. I was going to go through all the Outcast gang tactics cards, but there are 12 of them in the book, and there are more in the packet that you could bought if you actually bought the physical cards, and that would take quite a while to go through all of them, so I'm just going to hit on a few of them right now. Uh, the first one, A Few Friends. This card allows you to pretend for one game that you're a house Cawdor. You begin the game with D3 plus 2 more Hive Scum. This is a great way to get more activations than your opponent, and whomever has the most activations in a turn usually has a big advantage. It also gives you 3 to 5 extra guys that you can definitely just throw away, and you don't have to worry about them because they are not going to be back for the next battle anyway. The next card, Dirty Tactics, allows you to activate another friendly fighter immediately after you've already activated one. It's like another group activation, except your opponent isn't expecting it, and it can beat any fighter anywhere on the battlefield. Fight Another Day can preserve your leader and is a card I usually have in my back pocket when I play. It's played when one of your fighters goes out of action and it counts the lasting injury roll as an out cold result, basically giving your ganger you play it on an extra life. Lucky Score is nice because at the end of the game you play the card and get d6 times 10 credits, regardless of any other factors, so long as the scenario has credits as rewards. And finally, Hard Rounds makes both players roll 2d6 for the bottle test instead of 1d6. Use this if you really need to force your opponent to bottle out, just make sure you can either make your test or make sure you won't have to take one. Well, I hope you enjoyed my look at my pirate gang. And I hope I gave you some insight into how you can create your own gang using historical or other media as inspiration. And I hope you enjoyed watching me set up my sump table also. That's all I've got for you this time. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe.